Every once in a while, in the sea of media I have consumed, I come across a character that stands out. A character that feels real, like they could one day walk right through your door and have a conversation with you about anything. And over time, quite a few characters of fiction have demonstrated this ability to pull the empathy out of us and break the conventions of normalized fiction. On several occasions, I've even had to look up if a story is true because the writers did such a good job of conveying a realistic portrait of our world within the confines of their work. However, just because a series is realistic does not necessarily mean it's good, nor does a fantasy series automatically feel contrived with characters who act in unrealistic ways. Take for example the characters in, currently, my favorite anime, Made in Abyss. Each character has a specific design, a specific nature to their personality, motivations, feelings, and desires. Rico wants to explore the abyss and find her mom. Reg wants to protect Rico. And Nanachi, well, what starts as tagging along for the adventure becomes more necessary as the abyss grows stranger and more dangerous, and she's the only one with the experience and knowledge to guide the two adventurers. So Maiden Abyss is not a realistic world to our standards, but it is in context to itself. It feels like a real place, from the deep lore that surrounds it to the near suicidal attempts of the whistlebearers who plunge into its depths. And you feel that as you get to know these characters, as you experience things as they do, and just watching the cast grow from being naive dreamers at the start to full-fledged adventurers at the end. Now, on the other hand, there's this guy right here. Ugh, oh, god damn it. Okay, so most of you probably know Kirito. You might know from my other videos that I used to also really love SAO. And then I didn't like it at all for a while, and now going back, I I like it in a sort of nostalgic, carefree way. Though I have to admit, one of my main complaints with SAO was always just Kirito himself. As in, like, the guy doesn't really have a personality on his own. Rather, when a situation comes up, he kind of tends to gain a personality for the duration of that scene, and then kind of retracts back into himself again and becomes really desaturated. Now, if you're familiar with Reki Kawahara's other work, Excel World, you may know this guy, Haruyuki Arita. Now, Haruyuki is to Kirito what day is to night. If you were to take Kirito's character and say, hmm, I wonder what the opposite of this capable, stoic character is, you'd probably get something like this. A short, awkward, underconfident kind of guy. The difference is, for all the memorable character traits and personality of Haruyuki, Kirito is just kinda hollow. He exists, and that's pretty much it. All the relatability you might have for Haruyuki is erased with Kirito. Haruyuki grows through Excel World, while Kirito, with the exception of possibly the Aincrad arc at the beginning, when he's actually trying to escape SAO, feels like kind of an abandoned character in his development afterwards. And that problem echoes through a lot of the other characters in SAO. Don't even get me started on what they did with Asuna's character, I have no idea. My problem is that it leads to what seems like a character that's really only designed to fit a specific plotline of the story, and what results is a bland, uninteresting, and an unfocused personality. I feel like I don't know him at all. Like, his motivations as a result of the story just kind of feel flat, lifeless, and really are only used as a mechanic to move the plot forward, and not as a way for the viewer to actually sympathize with him. So overall, I feel Kawahara rewrites him every time a new plot emerges, and it just doesn't work. I could never imagine actually seeing this guy on the street, or in real life, because he just seems like part of a person, he doesn't seem like a real, complete personality. And of course this aligns with the thought that SAO is a plot-driven story, not a character-driven story, and I personally tend to enjoy character-driven stories more so. Ones where we as the viewers dwell deep into the lives of our protagonists, antagonists, and others. Learning about how they live, and how they cope with the world around them. And I've rarely seen it done better than in the series Violet Evergarden. Now, Violet Evergarden tells the story of, well, Violet Evergarden, as the name would suggest, a disillusioned soldier trying to move on after a devastating war, 
learning the meaning of love, and coming to terms with the disappearance of a person very important to her, Major Gilbert. Now, one thing that's a bit ironic about Violet Evergarden's realistic nature of her personality is that the show itself writes her in an extremely, well, fictional sort of way. Violet was found as an orphan by Dietfried, Gilbert's brother, on an otherwise abandoned island in the sea. From there, she was taught by the military to become a weapon of mass destruction, downing enemies left and right. And if a scene of a lolly girl slaughtering soldiers seems kind of strange to you, all I can say is, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to anime. But this is all told through flashbacks. By the time the series starts, these events are all in the past, and Gilbert is gone, with Violet desperately trying to cope with the loss. And this, my friends, is honestly one of the most grounded depictions of emotional turmoil I've seen in any piece of pre-existing media. Now, I think what's so fascinating about Violet Evergarden is the show's approach to humanizing her as a person, and how even as a killing machine without previous emotion, we as the audience can come to love this flawed, jaded character. Because in the end, yeah, maybe it's not realistic to have a 14-year-old girl savant killing machine turned auto-memory doll, but when you watch the show, it feels perfectly realistic. The willing suspension of disbelief just kicks in, and we experience every tingling, every stage of grief, and each desperate attempt by Violet to try to move past Gilbert's presumed death. And how, even at the end of it all, she still persists in keeping his memory alive. With this, plus all of the interwoven plot lines, the story manages to stay very coherent and focused. I never felt the characters went on tangents, or there were filler episodes that were present, because for almost every person Violet helped, there was a follow-up. Like the playwright finishing his production, or the young princess getting married, or the young girl receiving letters up to 50 years after her late mother's death. All of these elements help to provide a narrative that feels complete, and a world that feels lived in. Which brings me to the setting. Leiden is a fictional European town that is used in the story, and while I caught a few odd elements like Benedict Blue saying, Let's get yakisoba at a festival. Want some yakisoba? Because I really feel like a European city set in post-World War I wouldn't just have yakisoba stands at a festival, but oh, okay, okay, fine, I'll, I'll just go with it. Other than that, nothing really caught my eye. Wait, is that a Ford Mustang? Okay, small details aside, Leiden feels like a city right out of the 1920s. The steam engines, the architecture, and the typewriters lend a sense of time that puts Violet's perspective in a world recovering from war. And though Leiden looks fine on the outside, it's the citizens' individual stories where you really get to experience how the war has reshaped the lives of many, few more than Violet herself. Added with the show's writing is the wonderful soundtrack, using an orchestra to add lush, expressive, and emotional accents to every facet of the production. Added with Kyoto Animation's incredible artwork, the whole series feels like a movie in terms of the top-notch production value, and both sequel feature films expand on that. Now, I uh, must also acknowledge Violet Evergarden is animated in what I would consider to be a very soft style, comparatively to the strikingly dark techniques of shows like Kaiji Ultimate Survivor, or the loose and fluid movement of shows like Samurai Champloo. And yet, the style of Violet Evergarden fits so well for the show's context that almost any scene from it could be easily considered wallpaper quality. The characters are all conventionally attractive, and though I typically like to see a variety in character designs, seeing the old, the young, the ugly, the pretty, everything. I have no particular issues with this fact. I mean, hell, at least they're nice to look at and actually have noses for one. So those are pretty much my thoughts on the series. I absolutely love it. It is a great piece of media that I think most people should consume who like anything on, you know, the side of human nature. And moving on, we examine the Violet Evergarden movie. Not the first one, but the final one. So spoiler warning in case you haven't seen the conclusion. I'll put a timestamp up on screen if you want to skip this section, otherwise sit back, relax, and let's talk about what makes the movie such a wonderful conclusion to the series. A while ago, I sat down with a friend and he expressed his opinions to me on Violet Evergarden. 
These opinions were essentially on the conclusion of bringing Gilbert's character back into the show, revealing he was alive the whole time. My friend thought it might be a mistake since arguably the entire first season was in fact designed to show the viewer how Violet slowly came to terms with Gilbert's absence and how in the original conclusion of the series she never denied his living but instead expressed that she would be okay on her own. The first season solidified Violet's purpose to live and to move on from the trauma of losing Gilbert in the war. And I can definitely see where my friend's coming from. It could be seen as inconsistent or even just a complete waste of plot development that once Violet finally learned how to move past Gilbert, that she immediately relapsed at a single handwritten letter indicating he still might be alive. However, the way the show was structured suggests that there's more to that than was on the surface. And also, I never felt that Violet's character ever completely got over him. They even made that pretty clear by the end of the first season. See, what we hadn't gotten until the final movie was Gilbert's point of view. All we saw was how Violet saw him before and during the war, but by the time the movie occurs, Gilbert has changed a lot. He stifles his happiness and he hates himself, partially for his part in the war, but mostly for the fact that despite his kindness towards Violet, in the end he still caused her so much pain as a tool of war, leaving her broken and devastated at the start of the original series. As a person who openly would have cried at a simple warm reunion between the two, I admit this twist felt all the more traumatic, especially for Violet, who is rejected by the one person she cares about more than anything, including herself. What strikes me as well done about this idea is that it shows the viewer that while Violet was living her life trying to move on, Gilbert was also doing the same, but in a different way. Instead of facing the trauma of his past like Violet had to do, Gilbert runs away as far away from anyone and everything that he can, convinced of the fact that he will do less damage if people think he's dead, than assure them he's okay. He still has love and compassion deep within him, but on the surface he's too afraid to face the people he's caused pain, and watching Violet get rejected when she was on the other side of the door, only feet away from him, trying to explain that she still loved him, was honestly one of the most unbearably painful things I've seen since I started this whole journey. Now, of course, I will admit I had my guesses about the conclusion, and I knew they couldn't just leave it there. I mean, <laughs> Violet needed a good ending, and evidenced by all the spoilery Netflix promotion clips on YouTube that are circulating these days, I think you all know where I'm going with this. What we got was, of course, an extremely emotional conclusion to the series, and one that left me both happy and sad. Sad that it was over, but really happy for the characters who at this point really felt to me like real people with feelings, thoughts, and desires. And moving on, it's unavoidable to say that everything in the series was done perfectly. I really don't have much to complain about, I rarely do with series that make me tear up as much as this one has, but there are a few things I would point out. Regarding the movie Violet Evergarden, um... It's really long. It's it's over two hours long. And I love that Kyoto Animation gave us that scrumptious runtime, but I would say that the second half of the movie, particularly the time where Violet reunites with Gilbert, is kind of needlessly drawn out. Like, don't get me wrong, I like my running toward the one you love because you just realize you want to be together for real anime trope just fine, but it's happened in a lot of other movies already in the 2010s. Like, a lot of movies. And I just felt that, in this case, it, it, it just wasn't necessary. I mean, we already know Gilbert was going to change his mind and go after her, but he runs down a hill, and Violet jumps out of a boat to meet <laughs> A fucking boat. She jumps out of a fucking boat to meet him. Again, it's, it's honestly kind of funny, and I don't mind it really, but in a scene so highly anticipated after we've waited the whole series for this... Just a subtle meeting between the two would have been actually perfect. Just a heartwarming hug or something like that, and we did get that, but we had to wait through a lot of pomp and circumstance to get there. And I know that the show is always very grandiose, and at times kind of over the top in its presentation in an interactive story, but just knowing they're together at the end was enough without the big emotional running climax taking place. Again, if that's my worst problem with the show, I'm not doing so bad. 
A few other nitpicks with the series are the odd variations of show don't tell, where an emotional scene will be felt with the characters and then the next thing you know they say exactly what was just expressed through crying or other visual cues on the screen. Now this is a common trope in anime and often leads to minimizing the impact a scene can have on the viewer. If anything, I didn't find it to be a huge problem, but I still felt like certain scenes could have been more memorable had the subtext not been jammed down the viewer's throat. In any case, there's really not much else to say about this. This series is an incredible masterpiece in my opinion, and I've pretty much enjoyed every moment of it. It's really special for me because of the many, many, many shows I've seen. This one always felt unique. It felt like a standalone experience that forged its own path and as a result stands on its own as one of my favorite anime. And the series made me cry, it made me tense and it made me laugh. And I'll always have those memories. So thank you Kana Akatsuki for writing this and thank you to Kyoto Animation for bringing the story to life in this wonderful adaption. I'm really glad it was everything I had hoped it would be and more. I'm really glad I could experience the beauty of Violet Evergarden. Everyone, thanks for watching. I enjoyed making this one a lot. Like and subscribe if you want, and I'll put a link in the description to my other video, How Violet Evergarden Teaches Us About Grief. And, of course, let me know your thoughts on this show. Anyway, hope you liked it. Thanks for watching.